And by the way, when you do this, when I, when I have to deal with a school and difficult children, I bring all the teachers into the room and it is the most amazing experience when you force the English teacher and the phys ed teacher and the maths teacher and the science teacher to listen to each other. It reminds me once when I was writing a kid's report in science and I was sure he was a D and before I wrote it, thank goodness, I looked at everybody else's reports and realised he was phenomenal in everybody else's class except mine. And I thought, oh well, settles that. It's me, it's not him, uh, it's us. Uh, so it's that kind of idea. That's good. Another simple thing maybe, or a comp I don't care what, yeah. I'd ask the student to repeat the instructions after I've done everything, the pictures on the board, talked about it, and I, so I'd say, okay, what are you going to do first? Okay. And I might ask a student I know who could answer the question easily, say what they're going to do first, and I'd say, and I'd say what, what did they say? What, what okay, so you try and ensure comprehension of the instruction and then it could be a memory problem at worst, but it's certainly not a processing problem. Yeah, you can do that. That would be more information. Absolutely. That's your business, right? In the first one, if you had the first one and you wanted to choose between the kids clicking so you can tell them to stop, it means you notice the clicking, or they're clicking because they think better when they're clicking, and it's subconscious or unconscious, how could you test it? What could you do? Ask them are they aware they're clicking. Okay, but you've already told them in the scenario it says you've commented on it before. Twice already. Give them your clickless pen. Ah, give them a clickless pen, then I might tap it. But give them a stress ball. Yep, that'd be easy enough to do, wouldn't it? Now if they if they were attention seeking, they'll throw it. If they're just kinesthetic, they'll probably keep just squishing it. Okay, so this is how you've got to think. By the way, cross out B, I deliberately do that to annoy people. Um, because I don't think Dreykus has a satisfactory explanation for B. I can't see any. Any questions before lunch? Okay, I'm here if you've got any. After lunch, we're going to move into the last leg of this, which is how do you identify teachers? and their motivations and then how do you support them, okay? I am giving you a questionnaire that I should be trialling in some schools shortly. For you it's PD, for them it's going to be research, but, and I'll even collect yours if you'll let me. What I'm trying to work out are things that are integral to your job, right, now, your job now. Your job now is to try and figure out why teachers do what they shouldn't do, or don't do what they should do, and what might be of support to them. Now, I've spent a, bit of fa a fair bit of time on this already, so it's starting to look like a finished product, and I certainly intend to use what you give me to see if I can polish it up even further. So it's actually gonna take about 10 minutes max of quiet time as you read through, and hopefully actually complete it if you don't want to complete it, you don't have to complete it. You might just read it and while you're sitting there, try and work on the first um, page in particular, the page of the 23 explanations why teachers do things they shouldn't and categorise them any way that makes sense to you. But it would be much better for me and for the next group of teachers if you'd simply fill it out. And then we can talk about it once you've done that. What you'll see is that this is a questionnaire that has been trialled before and there's some confusion in the wording I just realised, which is a very good reason to trial your research stuff. The first one talks about teachers in general, because in some cases it's got no, there's not a word I in the first batch of 23, but the second batch says I, and that's a problem for me in terms of research, but I'm not going to worry about it at the moment. I'm more interested in the first batch. The reason I, I offer you the first batch is because if you were to scan the literature as to why teachers lose it with kids, um, you will probably remember tap dancing on the table as a process that I identified as one of the reasons. Okay, so if I were to play this out, let's try. We're now saying that these are two research questions. And the, question, the answers you've got there came from literature. Why, I mean, why, whoops, sorry. No one's gonna tell me, huh? Uh, why would teachers 
be irrational to that extent, or rational, why would they do stuff, everything from the edge, edge in the voice through to the, the harsh stuff? Why do they? That's, that's really the question I'm trying to address at the minute. Because if you don't know that, you don't know what PD to offer. You're going to be in the business of supporting people. You know what's good practice. We've, we've identified ten, potentially what's good practice. It's all the things we spoke about earlier. It's talking to your own kids. It's um, talking in a way that's adult. It's providing for the needs of challenging ch kids rather than focusing on their terrible behaviour. It's doing what's not necessarily logical. Why do teachers not do it that way? Why are you going to have some teachers, for example, in your school who will say these kids are only deserving of punishment and don't talk to me about helping them or being nice to them? That's the question I'm trying to address. And there are three. Now, have a look at those explanations given. If you are clever, you might find three theoretical groups, three groups in there in those 26, uh, 23. Anyone want to venture a guess? Let's see if you can induce a theory. I'm, I'm just a little bit sort of confused now yeah. because I'd, um, I was thinking that this might be something like um, occasionally you, you might lose it. That's the same reasons, yeah. But you're, you sort of, you're talking about a teacher who actually, um, when they're not feeling emotional, has a belief that forming a relationship with students is um, not a productive thing. No, it could be either. I don't know. So if I ask... <laughs> They are, and that's why it's a complicated thing, because you can't assume teachers any time edge off with students, but I know most do, but many ones say they do in research. What I'm, when I ask about what, what you do, if you do it, and you'll notice I've even put edge in the voice in there to include most people, right? Now, now let me do my first bit of market research. When you were answering this, how many were thinking in terms of yourself? That's what I'm counting on. That when people answer this, they'll actually think of themselves because there are times when my, and which is what you did. And that's what I'm really counting on. But if you didn't, I have to give them something to respond which is going to be helpful, and that is, what about other teachers? So even though it says teachers, my assumption is I'm getting an indication to some extent of the person themselves. That makes you not a good sample because you have been selected to be probably more productive than most teachers in your school. I don't know, I'm guessing. Uh, and so you are going to give me a restricted sample of responses. But it, it, it's enough for me to play with the questionnaire to do what I need to do. Um, but when I get into the real schools, and I put this broadly across schools, I will know what all teachers are thinking is promoting their behaviour. That's what I'm after. And that's the first bit of market research I needed to do. I needed to know that you were thinking of yourself in general. Because that's what it was main, mainly aimed to do. Okay, so. Let's 